Fair use under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976 is invoked for this video. Allowance is made for fair use for the purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, education, and research. This video abides by YouTube's hate speech policy for educational content. This video documentary is for educational, scientific, research, and scholarship purposes only. This video does not contain any hate speech or promote violence or hatred. This video does not claim that any group of people is inferior or subhuman. I'm Brother Nicholas James Vanderling, and today is the 11th day of the ninth month on the official Enoch calendar that I published. The solar calendar in my calendar that I published is correctly calibrated. Today is November 28th, 2020. This video is being broadcasted from the country of Cyprus, and this video is identifying the real descendants of Judah in the last days. In this video, I will interpret a 3,700-year-old prophecy in Genesis chapter 49 that Jacob made of the traits that his son Judah will have in the last days. And we are at the end of the last days. These traits, from what I can tell, have never been correctly interpreted and published online. None of these traits fit the description of those claiming to be Jewish in descent and the modern state of Israel, or the black Hebrew Israelites for that matter. Rather, by these prophesied traits, I will identify they belong to a prominent group of people and nation who have a buried history of being identified with Israel. This video combines Bible prophecy and anthropology to restore the identity and location of the real blood descendants of Judah. My method to restore the ancient identities of races and peoples is to interpret end times Bible prophecies, as we are at the end of days, and use the interpretation of the prophecy as the foundation of my hypothesis. From there, I combine and apply anthropology, history, and genetics to identify the ancient races in the modern present day that we are in. To classify blood descendants of Judah, this pertains to a people who are paternal descendants of Judah only through their father's male line, their Y DNA, the Y chromosome that is passed from, uh, from son to son to son to son to son which is the only biblical identification of who is a genuine blood Israelite. This means that this is a stock of people of the same genetic group, a homogeneous population. In my previous video that I just released about 15 hours ago, which I published yesterday, I used the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 14, verses 20 and 21, to explain that a portion of those claiming to be Cohen priests and or Levites in these last days are really blood Canaanites. This means that the other Jewish people who share the same Y DNA haplogroup as these Cohen priests and Levites are also Canaanites. In that video, I proved that by definition of a homogeneous race, which have the same and similar genes, that the Jewish people is not a race, but rather instead are an ethno-religious group of mixed people from various races. And here you can see this graph, and you can go watch the video from yesterday, that this graph is proof that they are an ethno-religious group of people of various races, and that they are not a race as defined by the definition of a homogeneous race. In the video that you're watching right now, I'm going to interpret six end-time prophetic traits about Judah and identify those traits to a European country, and I do not mean the Jewish people in the country, but rather the European country, a portion of it at least, being the real male blood descendants of Judah. My interpretation of Genesis chapter 49 verses 8 through 12 is originally mine and from what I can tell has never been published online before. I suppose not to be the first to come to this interpretation as others possibly might have come to consider 
the same understanding um, that I have, regardless of who's first, hallelujah, I'll praise to the Father and the Son. But what I'm sharing with you, I couldn't find any information lining up this specific country with this prophecy, and I'm blessed to share it with you. And if this be accurate, which I understand it to be, I give all praise to the Father and to the Son. Hallelujah. And here is the prophecy, the first two verses of Genesis 49. And Jacob, who's named Israel, called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear ye sons of Jacob and hearken unto Israel your father. So now that I have everybody's intention on this video, I hope that you hearken unto the interpretation of the Ruach HaKodesh as I break down this prophecy. The last days is plural, as you can see here, which is the last 2,000 years, so over this last 2,000 years of time period, and we are at the end of those 2,000 years or two days, however you prophetically want to call it. The last days prophecies of Judah will not only rule out the Jewish people and the modern state of Israel, but will also roll out the so-called black Hebrew Israelites claiming to be Judah, as you will see that they also do not fit or fulfill these prophetic traits that Judah would have in the end of days. Though I want to disclaim, I am interested in the African Chadic R1B haplogroup of the V88 branch. They share the same haplogroup as a lot of the Western Europeans, so this is interesting to me. I don't fully understand the migration patterns of R1B. So here is the Genesis 49 prophecy regarding the last 12, the, the 12 tribes, is that many scholars have used these prophecies within each tribe to identify the 12 lost tribes of Israel in the last days, as is the purpose of the prophecy. So the purpose of this prophecy is for us to recognize, is to use these prophecies, these traits to identify the Israelites that have lost their identity. Many have identified many of the Western nations that fit the prophecies, but have failed to identify Judah as they have not used Genesis 49 to identify Judah, but rather ignorantly assumed the false narrative that the Jewish people are Judah. When, as I proved in my last video, if you haven't seen it, you should watch it, that it's impossible for all the people who are unrelated, claiming to be Jewish, that they're unrelated to be related, and that they're not a race, but rather an ethno-religious group. One of the well-known subject leaders on identifying the lost tribes of Israel is a scholar named Yair Davidi. Yair has written many books and published many videos and pages of information on the internet on the lost tribes of Israel. Though I do not agree with all of his proposed identifications of the tribes and countries. Yair seems like a likable and nice man. I almost met Yair a couple of years ago when I started my journey that I've been on for the last three years um, in Israel, but our meetup never came to fruition. I've only had one email correspondence with Yair, it's very short. But regarding Yair, from what I know about Yair published on the internet, he is from Australia, has been living in Jerusalem area or Israel for some years, and he says his Y-DNA is R1B, specifically R-M222, which is an Irish-Scottish lineage. He is under the religion of Judaism, as you see him wearing his kippah right here. And he says he is de dedicated, right here in this purple, or in this magenta color, he says he has dedicated much of his life to regarding this subject. And he identifies those who claim to be Jewish as Judah, which he is in error. And here you can see on his book cover, he identifies Yehuda as the Jews of Judah, those claiming to be Jews. And it is error. So here is the screenshot of Yair's on one of his websites, HebrewNations.com, where he talks about his Y-DNA being RM222. He has the websites HebrewNations.org and BritM.org. And this is one of his earlier books that he had written called Biblical Truth. 
And despite Yair has dedicated much of his life to researching the tribes of Israel according to Genesis chapter 49, as you can see in this book, The Lost Ten Tribes of Israel in the West According to the Book of Genesis, Yair appears to only focus on ten tribes and not the twelve tribes. As you can see, the lost ten tribes. Yair appears to have ignored the prophecy regarding the tribe of Judah which I hope he did this out of ignorance. And yet here, my friend, if you're watching this video, let me interpret for you the last day prophecies of Judah in Genesis chapter 49, and let me identify Judah for you and for the rest of the world, and more so for my brothers and sisters in Messiah Yeshua who have the spirit of truth and love the truth. So here's the Genesis 49 prophecy of Judah in the last days. Judah, thou art he whom thy brother shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. This prophecy is approximately 3,700 years old, and it has several characteristics to identify Judah in these last days. In this video, I will interpret verses 11 and 12 and quite possibly identify the location of Judah in these last days. Many scholars, again, have used the end times prophecies of Genesis 49 to identify Ephraim and Manasseh and Zebulun and Issachar and other tribes, but they have failed to correctly identify Judah. So again, I'm going to be looking at five clues, maybe six clues, to identify Judah in the last days in verses 11 and 12. And in those two verses, in verse 12, there are two clues, wine and milk. And in verse 11, the clues are donkeys, phytoculture, which is vine growing, grape growing, wine, garments, and the color of the garments, wine and burgundy. So now let me go ahead and begin with the interpretation. Genesis chapter 49, verse 11 through 12. Binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be dark flashing with wine and his teeth white with milk. In these two verses, we seen vines and viticulture, which is grape growing, twice mentioned, right here and right here in verse 11. And we also see wine, including the blood of grapes, three times mentioned. Wine, blood of grapes, and wine. The emphasis on wine and viticulture in this prophecy, I understand, foretells that Judah in the last days will be known for his wine. And France is the largest and most prestigious wine producing country in the world. Here in 2019 chart, they accounted for 30% of the total wine exports of 11 billion US dollars, far surpassing Italy and Spain and Australia, Chile, and the United States. France is the largest and most prestigious wine producing country in the world. Genesis chapter 49, verse 11 and 12. Binding his foal into the vine and his ass's colt Unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be dark flashing with wine, and his teeth white with milk. In the prophecy, mentioned once is milk. So milk is also a clue to identify Judah in these last days. The definition for the Hebrew word for milk can mean milk, sour milk, and cheese. So it can be translated like dairy products. And France is known for their high quality cheeses and dairy products. As you can see here in 2019 on the chart of the top 15 countries of exports, France is number four, 
Germany's number one, Netherlands number two, Italy and France are basically tied for the fourth place. Germany and Netherlands dominates the market with the production of quantity, while France and Italy lead with quality, but they also produce a large amount of quantity as well. So here you can see a culmination of dairy products, of cheese, milk, butter, and cultured milk products. And when you combine all of these, France is number fourth in the world of total dairy exports about, and they would be considered number one in quality. Here are two maps of France. Of the wine production in France and all the different varieties of wine, that, of grapes and wine that's made that is grown in France, and also a map of all the different variety of cheeses all throughout the different regions in France. Each region has a specific type of wine or grape that they grow that they produce into that wine. And same thing, each region has a specific cheese that they make. It's pretty astonishing when you when you look at the different varieties that are all grown in France of the wine and the cheese and it is pretty amazing when you see in regards to Genesis chapter 49. So France clearly dominates the cheese and wine. So France clearly dominates and is the most prestigious wine and cheese producing country in the world. And since we're watching this video together, can anybody in the comment section name a Jewish or black Hebrew Israelite wine or cheese variety? I don't think so. So let's go ahead and we're starting to rule out these other people groups that are claiming to be of the tribe of Judah. Genesis chapter 49 verse 11. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Now we're dealing with the words garments and clothes, and France is known for their fashion. As you can see in this article, that the most fashionable countries in the world for 2019, Italy and France. They're basically head-to-head -head when you name off uh, the, the, the fashion producers within these countries. Italy has Guccio Gucci, Gianni Versace, Valentino, Robert Cavalli, Giorgio Mani, while France has Coco Chanel, Yves Saint Laurent, Christian Dior, Javinci, and also Louis Vuitton. So it's head in head, basically, number one. It should just be tied for number one with Italy regarding fashion. Genesis chapter 49, verse 11 again. Binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. So we know that wine stains and washing one's clothes in wine would dye the clothes that color. But the stain of wine can be very faint. And I'm not aware of any cultures that specifically dyed their clothes in wine or newly pressed grape juice, but I imagine it has happened. Rather, by interpreting this verse, it's conveying two popular colors used in dyeing clothes. As you can see, if you were to wash your clothes in wine, you're staining it, which is dyeing it, or you're washing your clothes in the blood of grapes, you're staining the clothes and dyeing the clothes, and you're dyeing it that specific color. And what do you know? The color wine is a color and according to Wikipedia, the name Bordeaux is actually synonymous with this color. And you can see the color coordinates right here in the Wikipedia article, and you could read about it right there under Claret here, that another name for this color is Bordeaux. And you could see these linen pieces dyed with wine, and look how faint the dyeing of wine is, but it can be darker. So France has the color wine and Bordeaux, which is the same color. And here you can see a Google search for garments dyed with wine. This lady's tie-dye shirt is dyed, dyed with wine. Her tie-dye shirt is dyed with wine. They say that this sweatshirt was dyed with wine. So it can get a little bit darker than just faint, but I haven't seen many. Like these wine-colored jeans are a color that's used in dyeing clothes. So the other color, the blood of grapes, is an additional color with wine. So I believe that there's two colors and that's what this verse is conveying to us. And it's a different color than wine and it's called Burgundy, named after the wine from the Bordeaux region of France. 
So Bordeaux is a city, but Bordeaux is also a region. And it's a little bit more brownish color. And again, it's another color that's common used in dyeing clothes. Here's the region of France called Burgundy, which is the color Burgundy comes from, the wine that comes in this region. And here's the city, Bordeaux, which is where the color wine comes from, AKA the color Bordeaux. This is prophecy, and this is not a coincidence. Binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. And it's important to know that there are a list of French donkey breeds, and especially in the Pyrenees Mountains, which is in the southwest of France, the French like their donkeys. And actually, they trek the land with donkeys loaded up, and they go on hikes and trekking the countryside with their donkeys. So they have their own breeds of donkeys. Donkeys are in the Pyrenees, and they trek with donkeys, and donkeys, donkeys are valued in the French culture and the culture of the Basque in the Pyrenees and also across the border in Basque and Catalan Spain, which bleed into southwest France. So now that I've gone through the prophecies, here is to recap the Genesis 49 checklist. There are six end-time prophetic traits of Judah in the last days. Donkeys, viticulture, wine, garments, the colors wine and burgundy, and dairy production. And as you can see, France can check them all off. The Jewish people cannot check these off, nor the black Hebrew Israelites. These prophetic traits to identify Judah in the last days clearly belong to a people group in France. And now that I've interpreted Genesis chapter 49, specifically verse 11 and 12, I also want to remind everybody else out there watching the video regarding verse 10, which is a prophecy regarding the end-time Elijah-type servant of Messiah, Yeshua. And I have a whole playlist that I've done. It's a progression of a playlist that's continuing. I'm building upon it of the end-time Elijah. And I recommend that everybody watch my videos regarding this playlist. So now that I've gone through Genesis chapter 49, verses 11 and 12 and identified France among those um, from the traits of verses 11 and 12. I now want to provide some bonus information on French Israelism and Judah being of France, somewhere in it or of it. So what's interesting is the people of France here, here at the time of Paul's journeys in Galatia, right here in Galatia in Turkey, we see the same group of people all throughout the major region of France, part here in Iberia, or what they called Celtiberi, and also up in Brittany, what's now England, and Scotland, and Ireland, and Northern Ireland. But the same group of people were spread throughout. Here in the Green Star right here is the city of Tarsus, where Paul was from. And next to it, over here is Antioch, which is the first church that or congregation that received the gospel of Messiah Yeshua as Paul brought there. This star is where I'm currently at. And here is, over here is um, the Celtiberi where Paul desired to go out to Spain or to this area to bring the gospel to these same people here. So Paul, not only did he go here to Galatia to bring the gospel, but he was desired to go all the way out here to Celtiberi as well. But these same people were called the Gauls, and they had a presence here in the region of France. The Galatians and the Gauls, the same genetic people group. Here's an article on French Israelism on YouTube. It's very small, I just got a screenshot of it. It's pretty small, but then it talks about the Monrovian dynasty. And this one guy lining them up with the tribe of Benjamin, but I'm here to tell you that France is lined up with the tribe of Judah more than anyone else in the world but it does make sense that Benjamin would be among Judah. You can read more about the Monrovian dynasty and the Frankish and the Frank rulers of the Frankish people, and you can do some more research there. And what I have here is a picture of a coin, the Yehud coin, and it's from the 4th century BCE. It's minted in Jerusalem around 350 BC, and it's one of the earliest known Jewish coins, and it's the first extra-biblical instance of the common usage of Yehud, or Judah, 
to denote the Israelite province. And as you can see here, this is the spelling of it, yod Hey dalit And on the obverse of the coin is a lily flower right here. And speaking of the lily flower, the words of the prophet Hosea, the lily was the national flower of Israel. It kind of symbolized that. Hosea chapter 14 verse 5 says, Yahweh says, I will be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily. So it's something that they would put a lily on this coin right here in the 4th century BC. And the usage of the lily on this coin apparently derived from the design that graced the capitals of the two main pillars that stood in front of the temple known as Jacob and Boaz. The reverse side of the coin right here has an image of a bird and zoologists cannot determine the exact species from the depiction. But again, near the word's heads is the Yod, the He, and the Dalit in the ancient Paleo-Hebrew script. And what you see down below the coin is the new state of Israel, the modern state of Israel, their one shekel coin, and it is designed after the ancient coin that uses the same lily flower. As you can see, this is the modern coin, this is the ancient coin. And regarding the lily flower, this design that you see is called the fleur de lis, and it is a stylized lily flower. In French, fleur means flower, and lis means lily, that is used as a decorative design and symbol. The fleur de lis has been used in heraldry of numerous European nations, but is particularly associated with France, notably its monarchical period. So this is the fleur de lis. And as you can see, here's the ancient coin of Judah, right here on the left, and here you can see a stylized fleur de lis design. So here on the Wikipedia page for fleur de lis, here are the, all the coats of arms and flags that use the fleur de lis as part of their heraldry. And you'll see that a lot of them are used in France and in the regions of France and also in the regions of northern Spain and, north, and northern East Spain as well. And under that same Wikipedia article, you can see the fleur de lis. It's used in retrospect to symbolize all the Christian and Frankish kings, and most notably, Charlemagne. The fleur de lis symbolic origins with French monarchs may stem from the baptismal li lily used in the crowning of King Clovis I. The French monarchy may have adopted the fleur de lis for its royal coat of arms. And here you can see the picture. I'm going to blow it up. But before I blow it up, I want to share something with you, or maybe it has an even earlier hidden and lost meaning that has been lost throughout the ages regarding the French people. So here's that picture of Charlemagne, and this is a rendition done by this man, Albrecht Durer, probably around like the late 1400s, early 1500s. And this is an anachronistic coat of arms, meaning it's used in retrospect above him, and they show the German eagle right here, and the French, the Fleur de Lis. And when I saw this picture, as I was researching the Fleur de Lis, that resonated with the Judah coin that you just saw. Here you can see that the Yehud coin has the same symbolism above the head of Charlemagne. You have the what could be the eagle with Yehud right here. And here you have the Fleur de Lis, the lily flower pattern, right here on his anachronistic coat of arms representing Charlemagne. This is absolutely stunning when I saw that. And that's it for the bonus information that I have right now. So I hope everybody out there who loves the truth, who has the spirit of truth, is blessed by the understanding, is blessed by my interpretation of Genesis chapter 49. I hope that you are blessed by it. Again, those traits fit no other people than the people in France. And if it be true, which I understand that it is, Hallelujah, and all praise to the Father and the Son. Hallelujah. Please comment in the video description if you have any other information to share. And now I have a quick message 
to Yair Davidi, my friend. And Yair, I hope that this information opens your eyes and you receive the truth of the interpretation of this prophecy. I also hope that you watch my previous video that I just sent out yesterday, published yesterday, where I identify the prophecy in Zechariah chapter 14, 20 to 21, and I identify Canaanite Jews in the last days. But more so, friend, and possibly my R1B brother, I exhort you to fear Yahweh Elohim, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and possibly the Elohim of your fathers, and receive the forgiveness of sins through faith in Messiah Yeshua. Renounce your religion of Judaism, take off your hat and your kippah, which is a sign to be under the authority of the Goy Rabbi, as that is not a commandment of Yahweh Elohim, and burn it. Put off your black garments, biblical sackcloth is black, and put on the garments of salvation, Yeshua. The blood of Yeshua, let it cover you, Yair. Fear Elohim and repent. Now is the time, and today is the day of salvation, Yeshua. And the time is very, very late, my friend. And so shalom to you if you fear Elohim and receive the testimony of Master Messiah Yeshua. Fear Yahweh Elohim and receive the forgiveness of sins through faith in Messiah Yeshua and the blood that covers you. Put it on as a robe of righteousness. And shalom to you if you receive it. But no shalom if you don't. Time is very at the end, and I hope that you do. So brothers and sisters of Messiah Yeshua, I hope that you're blessed by the information in this video. Please feel free to comment below. I look forward to most of the comments. Comments are published on approval basis only, and I reserve that right. And I hope that you're blessed by the information in this video. And shalom to everybody, the whole world out there, who have the testimony of Messiah Yeshua and guard his commandments, which are the Ten Commandments, plus the new commandment to love the brethren. Shalom to you. I'm signing off.